Hulu's annual Huluween event has dropped five fresh episodes of American Horror Stories, which, by the way, is a spin-off from American Horror Story. When American Horror Stories was first announced as a standalone anthology series, it sounded very promising because, come one, if anything, Ryan Murphy and the horror genre is a true match made in heaven. But, well, his reputation sort of tanked when the show's first season did not quite live up to expectations and felt oddly tied to the main American Horror Story universe in many unnecessary ways. In in contrast to that, Season 2 made some big improvements by working through the rough spots and delivering some solid, standout episodes like Facelift, which gave off serious Twilight Zone vibes. By the time Season 3 rolled around in 2023, the show had hit its stride with a solid creative team, offering a strong array of episodes that didn't have any real weak spots. In fact, it outshined the more recent seasons of American Horror Story and finally seemed to reflect what Ryan Murphy really excels at in the horror genre. Now, the newly released batch of five episodes from season three builds on the very same momentum, and honestly, I think they're some of the best stories this anthology series has told so far. It is also the perfect Halloween watch if you're in the mood for some top-tier horror. With that being said, let's discuss every new American Horror Stories episode in detail. But before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means an awful lot. Thank you, and let's begin. Backrooms. Both American Horror Story and American Horror Stories have pretty much covered every horror subgenre and trope you can think of by now. But the latest batch of American Horror Stories episodes takes a bold step into a more recent trend of liminal space horror. Specifically, dives into the Backrooms phenomenon, which originally blew up on 4chan and became even more popular because of YouTuber Kane Parsons' creepy short films. Interestingly, Parsons is set to direct a feature film adaptation of The Backrooms for A20 but it's pretty cool to see American Horror Stories get there first with its own eerie take on this strange, unsettling purgatory. Backrooms focuses on Daniel Hausmannberger, a big-time Oscar-winning scriptwriter who has only ever chased his fame. Despite all his success, Daniels has been living in isolation ever since his son Roman went missing. To cope, he has thrown himself completely into his work, shutting himself off from the outside world because, in his mind, there's nothing left for him out there. His agent and best friend, Aaron, tries to pull him out of his assuring Daniel that law enforcement is doing everything they can to find Roman and urges him to break free from the bubble he's created. But Daniel's not having it and tells Aaron to leave before going back to his workspace to focus on his next script. But things take a strange turn when Daniel walks into his writing room and suddenly finds himself in the mall. Confused he tries to figure out what's going on, and that's when he spots a shadowy figure whispering into the ear of a white masked boy who looks an awful lot like Roman. When Daniel tries to reach out to the boy, he is abruptly transported back to his home, leaving him even more bewildered. After returning from the strange liminal space and realizing he's even in different clothes, Daniel decides to call Aaron to apologize for being rude, and that's when he finds out that his experience in the mall wasn't just a hallucination because he was actually missing from the real world for three weeks. Completely stunned with this predicament, Daniel agrees to meet Aaron at a restaurant and when he arrives, he finds his ex-wife Reva sitting with Aaron. Daniel assumes they've staged some kind of intervention, but the truth hits even harder when they tell him that Roman is dead. The police found his body buried with his red blanket in the woods behind the playground on Latham Street just two weeks after Daniel had disappeared. There was still no word on who killed Roman as the police are still working on DNA and fingerprints, and this new sense Daniel spiraling into a bizarre rant about how hell exists alongside our reality and is an extensive world manifested by us. Fueled by anger and grief, he vows to find and kill whoever murdered his son, then abruptly storms out of the room. Daniel heads to the bathroom of the restaurant and once again finds himself in that strange liminal space, only this time it was just an empty space with green wallpaper. Desperately searching for an exit, he stumbles upon a ladder leading to a vent. At first, he avoids it, but when there's no other option, he reluctantly climbs in. On the other side, he finds a space filled with robes and masks. There was also a TV playing some rad movie. When Daniel changes the channel, suddenly a table full of extravagant food appears behind him. When Daniel pulls out his Oscar trophy from a roasted pig and the robes and masks spring to life as shadowy bodies, clapping and applauding him. Naturally terrified, Daniel tries to run, but he's stopped by a vision of Roman with his eyes gouged out. As Daniel reaches out to him, the masked figures push him back into reality 
reality, leaving him more shaken than ever. While still trying to make sense of his bizarre experiences in the back rooms, Daniel finds himself staring at his gun. For a moment, it seems like he's considering ending it all to escape his misery, but instead, he goes online to search for more information on the back rooms and stumbles upon a YouTuber named Eli the Navigator who claims to have entered the back rooms and even captured footage of it on his 8mm camera. The moment Daniel sees the familiar green wallpaper and Maul and Eli's videos, he's convinced to meet him. However, when Daniel looks deeper, he finds out that Eli is in jail for killing a triathlete named Charlotte Hansley. He was driving and distracted by his phone trying to claim a dog food coupon when he ran a red light and crashed right into Charlotte. While the crash didn't kill her instantly, Eli didn't call for help and just stood there watching her die. To make matters worse, Eli lied to the police about what happened and claimed that Charlotte ran a stop sign and hit his car. But the more he convinced himself that he wasn't to blame for her death, the more disconnected from reality he became, and that's when he first entered the back rooms. Eli believes that our minds are wired to only see the surface of reality, but there's more to it than we realize. According to him, when someone starts lying to convince themselves they're innocent even when they're not, that's when they slip into this strange purgatorial space. Now this really hit Daniel hard because he felt like Eli is implying he had done something criminal and is in such deep denial that it was causing him to fall into the back rooms. Eli then warns Daniel that if he wants to break free from this cycle, he needs to be honest with himself about his past. Otherwise, he's doomed to keep bouncing between reality and the back rooms until he completely loses himself. In the final moments of the episode, Daniel's house is surrounded by police, which prompts him to make a desperate call to Aaron, who angrily accuses him of killing his own son. Shortly after, Reba calls furiously berating him for what he's done. But Daniel still refuses to accept his sins. Instead, he heads to his workspace, pulls out his gun, and starts firing at the police. When they fire back, Daniel is shot and seemingly killed. As he falls to the floor, we see flashbacks of his troubled past, including his constant fights with Reva, strained by his failures as a husband and father because of his unhealthy obsession with work. We even see how Daniel walked out in their marriage when things got hard. But the biggest reveal comes when we learn the horrifying truth about Roman's murder. One day at the park while playing with his son, Daniel simply snapped and strangled his son to death. He later wrapped Roman's body with a red blanket before burying him in the woods. The weight of his guilt finally comes crashing down on Daniel's final moments. As Daniel's life slips away, he finds himself back in the back room, standing in front of a terrifying, demon-like red woman who is holding Roman's lifeless body. They are surrounded by those same ominous masked people in white masks and robes. This is when Daniel realizes that his only way out is by confessing to the truth about Roman's death and swears to the Red Woman that he'll confess to the authorities, admit that he killed Roman and face the consequences if she just lets him leave the back rooms. It seems like she grants his wish and Daniel is pulled from her lair, but soon it becomes clear that he's far from free. Instead of re-entering the real world, he finds himself in an empty way room with magazines about fatherhood ironically scattered on the table. He's then handed a token with a 20-digit long number with a message board showing that the current number in session is token 1, meaning Daniel is in an impossibly long waiting line and is trapped in a purgatory for an eternity. Clone. Clone feels like a bit of a watered-down version of Black Mirror and is probably the weakest of the five new episodes. Directed by Max Winkler, the story focuses on a tech billionaire who creates a robotic clone to take over his duties after he is hospitalized. The episode begins with a young school teacher named John cooking dinner for his partner David on his birthday. Now, David Randolph is a pretty old billionaire and tech mogul with failing health. While David seems fulfilled with his relationship, it's not the same for John and feels more like an unheard accessory than a partner. When he whines too much about not having any authority over David, the old man pulls out keys to a Ferrari and gives it to John. Unfortunately, the next day while teaching the kids at school, John gets a call from David's doctor who informs him about his partner suffering a stroke. When he reaches the hospital, John is stunned to find out that David has already used his resources to create an elaborate contingency plan in case a situation like this happened. David's team shut out any medical help and put him in a medically induced coma. When John tries to intervene, he finds out that the legalities of the situation have his hands tied. As the team takes David to his lab to try out an advanced treatment, John decides to go back home. He is visibly depressed and is grieving the absence of his partner, so one day he decides to go to the lab to check on David's health. On his way, John looks at the window of the lab and, strangely enough, finds David standing and waving at him. Naturally shocked at what he saw, John breaks through the security of the lab and runs upstairs to look for David, only to find the upper half of his clone body with a bunch of 
wires sticking out. This is when Anka Kislowski comes in to take John to David's room where he was lying in a comatose state while being hooked onto a bunch of machines. Following this, we learn about the billionaire's real contingency plan which involves creating an identical android named David to keep John company while he is incapacitated. The idea is that David will provide companionship so John won't be alone while also allowing the company to test out their AI technology. In a video message recorded before his stroke, David explained to John why he wanted him to spend time with the AI clone. The idea was to help the android become more human, although the AI version of David looked, thought, and remembered things just like the real David, he still lacked warmth and emotion. David believed that John was the key to fixing this. Since John played a huge role in shaping who David had become, he was convinced that spending time with John would help the android experience more human, romantic, and loving emotions. Without much options in hand, John agrees to follow through with David's wishes. When the clone David gets delivered, John is stunned at how identical the android looks. At first, John rejects the AI clone, feeling uneasy about the whole idea, but over time he grows to love the AI version of David, maybe even more than the real David. Initially, the clone was also struggling to understand John and almost strangled him in the process of giving a back massage. But slowly, John helped it adapt to human emotions by opening up to the android himself. They cooked together, ate dinner together, and John was even able to teach clone David a few wine etiquettes. The clone began making John breakfast and even started getting jealous when he got a call from his friend Jordan, inviting him for a run. On the same night, John and Jordan came back home high in edibles. When John decided to call it a night, Jordan tried to rape him, which was something the clone had taken note of. After John threw Jordan out of the room, clone David called Jordan out on the way for stealing a bottle of lotion from the bathroom. When Jordan picked a knife to threaten the android, clone David plunged the same knife into Jordan's chest, picked out all his teeth to grind it to dust, chopped his body up into little pieces and birthed everything to wipe off all evidence of the body. The next morning, when John figured out what the clone did in response to John hurting him, it fully shifted his feelings for the clone, and so he began to embrace this version of David more lovingly. Overwhelmed with emotion, John kisses the AI David and realizes that with the android, he can finally have the kind of relationship he always wanted with a real David, one where he feels like a true partner, not just a live-in housewife. John's connection with clone David is much more fulfilling and the two really hit it off. They start enjoying life together, going out at clubs, dancing, drinking, and just having a great time. It's the kind of relationship John had been longing for. Just as John starts imagining a future with the android and sees the potential, in their relationship he gets a call from David's company who informs him that the real David has woken up and that his time with the android is over. After a heartbreaking farewell where the android confesses his love for John, clone David is packed up and sent back to the facility, but the impact of their relationship still lingers with John. Feeling the weight of what he experienced, John confronts the real David, confessing that he wants the relationship to change and is no longer willing to settle for the way things were before. You might expect the story to take a dark twist with John and clone David plotting to kill the real David so they can be together, but that's not what happens. Instead, the real David turns the tables and has John murdered by one of his minions. Apparently, the billionaire has realized that the only person who truly matches him in every way was his clone, and decides that he wants to be with the android version of himself. The the episode pretty much ends with a glimpse of David and clone David in bed after having sex. When the clone spots a strip of photos he had taken with John in a photo booth, he asks David if they know who that man is. David coldly replies, no, and then asks the clone to blow him again, thus making it obvious that John's memory has been wiped off from the android. Ward X. Most people can agree that finding a real cure for cancer would be life-changing, but how far are we willing to go to achieve it? Is there a point where we've gone too far? These are the questions explored in this episode of American Horror Stories titled X. The first thing that stands out when watching X is that it's the only episode filmed in grayscale because the episode doesn't give a clear answer, so we can only guess, but it's clearly a deliberate stylistic choice by the creative team. Typically, black and white visuals are used to set a specific time period, and X seems to take place before the 1950s, possibly even the 1930s, if the opening Ella Fitzgerald song is anything to go by. The episode begins with a view at Pinecrest Memorial Hospital, where a cheery security guard named Malcolm is on duty at the exit gate. While reading a Stephen King novel at night, a shadow of a mysterious woman in a hospital gown catches his attention, but before he can call for any help from the hospital, the woman simply vanishes into thin air. In the next scene, we meet Claire Michaels, who is a nurse 
nurse at the hospital and was trying to explain a tough situation to a mother whose son is suffering from cancer. The woman does not have insurance and without any advance payments, the hospital cannot approve surgery for her son. This is when the senior oncologist of the hospital, Dr. Eric Nostrom, interrupts their conversation and tells the mom about the hospital's Spring Hill program, which takes on special cases like her son's and covers all charges for the treatment. While Claire is surprised to hear about the program, for the very first time, the woman is elated to hear that there was finally some hope for her son's future. Later, Claire complains to her colleague, Lily, about how soulless her job has become and further asks about the existence of the Spring Hill program. Apparently, this program has existed for years and was started by Dr. Nostrom after his father died of cancer. Their conversation is suddenly interrupted by the sight of a patient with bloodied clothes, wandering the halls in a deeply unsettling way. Her mouth hangs open, frozen in a terrifying, unnatural expression. While Lily looks at this patient in horror, Claire steps in to help the woman, who we soon find out is named Alice, and even if she cannot speak, she can fully understand what is going on around her. After admitting her to one of the hospital beds, Claire gets her blood and asks Lily to take it to the lab. She then assures the patient that they would help her and tries to read a tag on her hand but fails to understand anything as it is too caked with blood. When they are alone, the patient tries to say something to Claire and this is when an orderly named Justin comes in to change the bedding of her room. So Claire leaves Alice with him to get another sample to the lab which Lily left behind. After getting to the lab, she finds out that Lily never submitted the blood samples in the first place and when she goes back to the room to check on Alice, all she found was Justin lying on the floor with a pair of surgical scissors shoved into his neck. It leaves Claire terrified and even after the cops arrive, they fail to track down Alice. Dr. Nostrom calms Claire down and suggests she go home with Malcolm who offers to wait for her until she is done getting her things. In the storage room, Claire is again cornered by Alice who does not harm her but leaves the hospital tag on the floor instead. Using this, Claire is able to learn a little bit more about Alice by insisting Lily to help her track down her files. Now, Alice's file on the computer doesn't reveal much, but what catches Claire's attention is that it lists Alice as diseased. Knowing that's clearly not the case, Claire digs deeper and finds Alice's paper file. Meanwhile, Lily keeps begging Claire to stop, who is hell-bent on doing the right thing. The paper file offers more details about Alice's stay at Pinecrest Memorial Hospital, where Alice was admitted for skin cancer. According to the file, she died on the operating table, and after being declared dead, Alice was transferred to Ward X, where the hospital, under the Spring Hill program, conducts experimental treatments on cancer patients in an attempt to cure them. But as Alice's condition shows, these experiments have horrific side effects, turning patients into zombie-like figures. We learn that Dr. Eric Nostrom has been using this ward to test cancer patients to horrific results. He experiments on these people to try and find a cure, leaving many of them disfigured or horribly maimed. That's how Alice became the way she is, but Nostrom is not the only one involved. Justin was in on it too, which is what Alice killed him for. In fact, Lily was the nurse who admitted Alice to Ward X, which is why she tried to stop Claire from digging up more dirt. But Lily did not know what was happening in Ward X and kept her mouth shut and the fear that she would end up up in the ward if she did not comply. Ridden with guilt, Lily runs up to the roof with Claire trying to stop her, grabs the file from her, and jumps off the roof. But by the time Claire gets down, the file has already been removed by one of the hospital staff, something that Malcolm points out to her. After discovering the truth about Ward X, Claire takes what she's learned to Dr. Nostrom, not realizing she's deeply involved in this sinister program. The oncologist soon reveals his secret and tries to recruit her, insisting that they're helping people. But after seeing what they did to Alice, Claire isn't fooled and refuses to join Dr. Nostrom or support the Spring Hill program. Her decision proves quite unwise in that moment as Dr. Nostrom quickly turns violent, realizing how determined Claire is to stop the program. To keep her from exposing Ward X, he tries to strangle her, planning to make her with his next test subject. But in a desperate struggle, Claire manages to injure his eye and knock him out before escaping. Unfortunately, neither Claire nor Malcolm gets a happy ending. Malcolm, who teams up with Claire to uncover the truth in X, seals his fate by doing so. By the episode's end, both he and Claire are brought to Ward X as Dr. Nostrum's next test subjects. While they're strapped to the operating table, Dr. Nostrum reveals that he plans to give them cancer and experiment on them, just like he did with the other patients. 
In a final twist, Alice escapes again and helps Claire kill Dr. Nostrum and the attending nurse. After Nostrum's death, Claire thinks that the nightmare is over, but when she wakes up, she quickly realizes that's not the case. Desperate to expose the horrors of Ward X and the Spring Hill program, she tells Detective Samuels everything she knows and agrees to let her show him the secret facility, giving Claire hope that justice is finally within reach. However, when they arrive, Claire's hope shatters. She sees Alice has been locked back in her cage and Malcolm in a similar similar zombified state, this is when it becomes clear that Detective Samuels won't be the hero she thought he was. Instead, he stands by as the nurses take Claire away to be experimented on, just like the others. In a chilling revelation, Detective Samuels confesses to Claire that his daughter has leukemia, and he would do anything to save her. The people behind the Spring Hill program promise to cure his daughter in exchange for his silence and cooperation. With that, Claire is led away knowing that the system meant to protect her has betrayed her. At the end, while being strapped onto a chair, Claire desperately insists that Ward X should be shut down, believing that killing Dr. Nostrum was enough to end the horrors. But one of the nurses coldly reminds her that the Spring Hill program is bigger than any one person. Dr. Nostrum was just a small part of a much larger machine. The program's reach extends far beyond his influence, with countless others involved, and they won't stop until they have perfected their so-called cure. Leprechaun. In Leprechaun, the story shifts to a small, struggling town on the verge of collapse, deep-seated in a twisted version of the Leprechaun folklore. The episode opens in 1981 where a drunk man is drawn to a golden light coming out of a well and jumps into it. In the current year, the world has modernized, but the well still exists around a small town's local bank. We then meet Colin, who is struggling to find a job. With his fiance being pregnant and him wanting to leave the town, Colin gets an opportunity to reconnect with his childhood friends, the Eastie Boys. Despite his partner Haley's warnings, he decides to meet them for a harmless beer. But the reunion takes a dark turn when Colin finds himself drawn into their plan to rob the very bank where Haley works. Lured in by the promise of quick gold, now he's caught in a difficult position torn between the loyalty he feels to his old crew and the responsibility he has to his family. Things only get weirder when we hear more news about missing locals. The story of the cursed well dating back to 1851 is clearly looming over the town, hinting that its string of bad luck might not be a coincidence. The curse, something the locals jokingly yet uneasily blame on leprechauns isn't just a spooky tale for kids. It feels like a real malevolent force that's been quietly pulling the strings in their lives all along by luring people to their doom to feed on their blood. Anyways, the Eastie boys start planning their heist. Liam's plan centers around using Declan's job in surveillance to slip past the bank's security. But they're not after the cash, but the untraceable gold worth $5 million, rumored to be hidden in the bank's vaults. As the crew gathers at the local bar, Liam tries to convince Colin to join him. He had almost walked out, but the temptation of a better life drew him back to the heist, with him settling on leading the crew. They decide to send in Finn first to hide in a washroom till the bank shuts at night. Later, Finn would let Liam and Colin inside as Declan swaps the surveillance with a pre-recorded video from the night before. Plus, Haley would go over to her grandmother's for the night, allowing Colin the window to pull the heist. Everything was going according to plan until it was not. Declan, who was monitoring the surveillance of the bank, was the first to note something moving inside the bank. When his friends don't listen, Declan decides to go in, but in turn he is lured in by the leprechaun and meets his end in the van itself. Following this, Haley's grandmother repeatedly keeps asking for her medicine, so she goes out to check if it hasn't been ready yet. We then see her outside the bank's gate where Haley finds Declan lying dead. Things inside the bank also start to get more intense as Colin starts welding the lock gate inside in which they find the gold. When Finn goes to find a flashlight, a gold coin rolls on the floor and moments after he picks it up, a scaly leprechaun jumps him and bites him on the neck to suck out his blood. Following this, Haley walks in to find Colin and Liam sealing the gold. Shockingly enough, the leprechaun wearing a white onesie follows after and Haley instructs him to take Liam. Colin looks at her in disbelief when Haley tells him about the leprechaun's living in the tunnels beneath the bank, where it is easier for the creature to sink its teeth into the necks of its victims and drain their blood. He learns that Haley is a half-breed leprechaun who has been in on the deadly scheme to lure townspeople to their doom and feasting on the blood of their greed. Heartbroken and vulnerable after stealing the cursed gold, Colin doesn't resist when Haley, though reluctant, gives in to her bloodthirst and kills him. 
Although the others deserved their fate, Colin's death is far more personal. The very reason why he resorted to the heist was because of his desperate need to support his partner and their soon-to-arrive baby girl. However, he did not know that the promised gold in the back is part of a trap set by leprechauns who had immigrated to the U.S. centuries ago and now used their lure to ensnare unsuspecting victims. Plus, Haley being a half-breed leprechaun can appear more human than the rest of her kind, which is what fooled Colin all this while. Before she kills him, she reveals that she needs much less blood than the elders of her race. Her secret identity as a leprechaun and her connection with the powers controlling the town just explains her hesitation to leave with Colin earlier in the episode. It wasn't just fear of change, she was deeply tied to the monsters that kept them both trapped in the town's sinister web. The episode ends with Haley and her grandmother drinking Colin's blood out of a cup, which only confirms her leprechaun heritage and how these beasts have been feeding on the town for decades. The Thing Under the Bed This episode focuses on Jillian, who is haunted by a nightmare of a young girl who's convinced there's something lurking under her bed and the monster is real, dragging its creepy, twisted fingers across the girl's bed. Jillian wakes up from the nightmare, revealing that she lives with her husband Mark and they've been trying to have a baby for a while. Mark thinks the stress from Jillian's nightmares has kept him from conceiving, but in reality, Jillian has secretly been taken birth control. Later, things take a darker turn when a mysterious force under the bed drags Mark into nothingness while Jillian desperately tries to save him. After the incident, Jillian moves in with her sister, Megan. Plus, Jillian is the prime suspect in Mark's case, and to complicate matters, Detective Watts keeps an eye on her movements. So to prove her innocence, Jillian starts investigating unsolved cases of people who had disappeared under the bed. Megan, worried that this obsession was a sign of Jillian's deteriorating mental state, urged her to let go of the past before it drove her to madness. But Jillian felt cornered with everyone blaming her for Mark's disappearance and was motivated to prove that he was killed by the monster lurking under their bed. Later, when Jillian confessed to Megan about taking pills to avoid getting pregnant with Mark's baby, it led Megan to ask if she could have unintentionally killed Mark. Megan remembered Jillian's history of acting out her dreams and theorized that Jillian's intense feelings about not wanting to get pregnant could have spiraled out of control, leading to an accidental death while acting out one of her nightmares. This idea sent Jillian into a rage. Feeling increasingly isolated, she stumbled upon a message from someone named Niles Taylor, who claimed to know what really happened to Mark. Desperate for help, she decided to reach out to him and arrived at a hospital to meet him. At first, Niles was hesitant to speak with her, but when he saw how desperate Jillian was for answers, he led her to a comatose girl named Mary, who had been in a vegetative state for the past 10 years. According to Niles, whenever Mary dreams, the lights flickered and the EEG monitor spiked and a monster emerged from under her bed. He claimed he had seen the creature himself, which is why he believed Jillian. Niles revealed that he too suffered from chronic nightmares, which made him question whether his visions of the monster were real. However, he had meticulously kept track of every time Mary's EEG spiked, and soon they discovered that the dates of Mary's convulsions matched up with a list of mysterious disappearances from people's beds. This led them to conclude that somehow, Mary was responsible for unleashing the monster on unsuspecting victims. Jillian then decided to visit Mary's father, Earl. It quickly became clear that the girl from Jillian's dreams wasn't a younger version of herself, it was actually Mary. According to Earl, after he put Mary to bed, a patient from Longview Sanitarium named Jacob Holler had broken into their home, intending to harm Mary. Earl had heard her screams and, in a desperate act of protection, killed Jacob right in front of her. This traumatic experience left Mary deeply scarred, and shortly after, she slipped into a coma. Jillian sensed there was more to the story and decided to spend the night in Mary's bed. As she drifted off, she somehow entered a liminal space where she and others like Mary and Niles could connect. In this dreamlike realm, an adult Mary explained that her thoughts and feelings were intertwined, allowing them to understand what each other was thinking while they slept. When Jillian asked Mary if she could sense what she was feeling during Mark's death, the question sent Mary into a panic, and the liminal space around them began to spiral into chaos. Suddenly, Jillian woke up to the sound of Niles calling her, urgently letting her know that Mary was dreaming again. At the end, Jillian discovers that one of the kids she has seen playing in the background of the liminal space has been killed. The little girl from the dream space had threatened to kill the boy because he was hurting her, and in response, Mary unleashed the monster lurking 
acting in her subconscious, resulting in the boy's tragic death. Jillian then realized that Mary interpreted Mark's advances on her as a threat and acted on it. Realizing the danger she poses, Jillian plans to dose Mary with the same drugs that had been given to her in Niles, which were meant to suppress their dreams. Jillian knows that if they can stop Mary from dreaming, they might be able to prevent further tragedies. When Niles agrees to speak with his superior after getting the medication that can stop Mary from dreaming, unbeknownst to them, Mary is eavesdropping in their conversation, and in a sudden turn, she kills Niles. Desperate for help, Jillian goes to Megan, who refuses to believe a word she says. Left with no other choice, Jillian heads to the hospital with the intention of killing Mary. However, Mary has regained consciousness and had moved to a different room at Earl's request. When Jillian enters Mary's old room to carry out her plan, Mary starts to convulse, unleashing the entity lurking under her bed to attack Jillian. It turns out that on the night Earl killed Jacob, the mental patient's soul fused with or entered Mary's body. Since then, they've been helping people they can reach through their subconscious if they sense trouble in their lives. Mary believed Jillian was trapped in her marriage, and that's why she felt justified in killing Mark. Now with Jillian trying to take her life, Mary isn't pleased and allows Jacob's spirit to drag Jillian under the bed, while Megan watches in horror as her sister vanishes into nothingness. So that is it, folks. Story time's over. With that being said, which is your favorite episode from the latest AHS releases? Let us know about your pick in the comments down below. As always, if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks, everyone.